down and listen to records Smell the cover, read all the verses Tell me about your favorites on vinyl and vision Hey folks, thanks for tuning in to the latest episode of Vinyl and Vision. Here we are with episode 92. Today's very special guest is Martin B.C. Uh, Martin is a uh, founder, engineer, producer for BC Studios in uh, Gowanus, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, he is also a musician. Uh, he actually has a very uh, brand new record out called uh, Feral Myths. Man, it was a great honor for me to be able to, to take some time and speak with Martin. Um, at his request, um, you know, what, what I do here at the show is I talk to people about an album that is influential to, to their art form, whatever it is that they make. And that's the way I proposed it to Martin. Um, but he came back at me saying, would you be interested in talking about an album that I've recorded? Now, the history of BC Studios is extensive. Um, there's over over 40 years of, uh, of music being recorded from there. And all a lot of really great stuff, too. BC Studios is responsible for recording a number of bands, albums, uh, like Sonic Youth, some of their earlier records, Swans, um, Material, uh, Herbie Hancock, uh, just to name a few. Uh, in this conversation, Martin also uh, reminds me of uh, recording with U.S. Maple and X Models. But, um, but Martin suggested this album, the Dresden Dolls self-titled debut. And uh, so now, being an older gentleman and having a little bit more understanding of what music is and can be, um, I listened to that record recently and I realized that it's actually a very good record. Um, yes, the songs are there, the, the, the compositions, the songwriting uh, crafting of the material is there. Listening to the, to the, to the dynamics of the record, to, to you know, the aspects of the actual recording and the way that it was recorded and the way that it presents itself as a as a piece um that was very alluring to me and so i did agree to do this and have this conversation based on an album that he participated in as opposed to an album that just kind of informed and influenced his work going forward so i think it's great um i hope you guys enjoy it as well I know it might not necessarily be your cup of tea. This album was not necessarily my cup of tea either, but like I said, I can appreciate it. I can understand it for what it is. I can understand it for, for what this conversation is. Um, and it's it's in depth and it's great. So um, if you're a fan of Dresden Dolls, this can be quite a treat for you. Uh, if you're not, if you're a fan of Martin and some of the work that he's done, this can also be a treat for you. If you're a gearhead, if you're uh, an aspiring producer or engineer, this is also kind of cool. So I hope you like it, and if you do, all that we ask here is that you please do all the things you do with the internet. Like, share, subscribe, comment, rate, review, all of those things. You can follow me on social medias. I'm on uh, Instagram and all that stuff. And um, if you care to help us in a more financial way, you can always go to our website, www.psychicstatic.net. Any purchase you make there goes towards uh, helping fund the show. And Lord knows we need it. So uh, also, um, I forgot to mention... Uh, a couple things that I will mention or I will list in the show notes uh, if you're interested in them. Uh, at the end of this episode, I talk with Martin about a few of the bands that he's most recently recorded. So, you know, not some of those historic bands that I've mentioned earlier, as well as um, links to uh, find Martin's documentary that I've purchased and watched, which is great, The Sound and Chaos. Uh, you can get it through his website for $4.99. It's a great deal. Don't totally worth it. So that'll be there as well as uh, a link to the Voice of Gowanus um, site where you can read up more about the political turmoil that Martin is kind of involved in as a political activist to uh, try to bring attention and to uh, some kind of uh, um, reform to the Gowanus section of Brooklyn. Because uh, from what I can see, based on the documentary that I watched, it's not it's not doing so great. It's... Um, you know, gentrification is not helping. Uh, it's a very polluted area of New York, um, and uh, there needs to be a lot of remediation to happen around there. And so all types of support that uh, is poured into them and through this organization, the Voice of Gowanus, can help uh, maybe have some of that remediation happen. And uh, I believe it's pretty sorely needed. So anything that you can do to help 
in that uh, in that fight, uh, raise some attention to the uh, to the cause is much appreciated. So thank you very much, folks. Enjoy. Hello, Martin BC. Hi. I was about to call you Mr. BC. Is that okay? Should I can I can I do that? You want to call me Mr. BC? <laughs> no. Sometimes I do. Sometimes I get people on the line and it's like, oh, hey, Mr. BC, how are you doing? And I, I know I shouldn't do that. It's a, it's a little bit of a respect thing, you know. It's just like when you're speaking to somebody. I mean, if you... Yeah, no, I. I uh, it's funny. That's a very American thing, you know. It's funny because my my family from Argentina had to um, get used to the idea that that in in like the even formal business settings that you would use first names. That Americans use first names. Right. Um, you know, even me dealing with like politics a bit more, like dealing with elected officials, calling my congressman Dan. Yeah. So I don't I particularly don't I don't particularly feel like Mr. BC. You yeah. Know? Um, uh, it's not. it's fine. But, you know, I guess I like being I'm I'm I'm, I'm a bit juvenile, you know, like I, I never grew up. So mm. I, I like to think I didn't. Um, the biological clock says otherwise, but I like to think I'm not that different than when I was, um, I, I don't even think wiser. It's not even a question of why maybe making a few better choices here and there, but I, I, I like to think I'm the same person I was when I was 20. Right. Yeah. I mean, well, Hey, you are, you are what you feel really. I mean, that, that's what I'm gathering as I get older myself. So, but uh, I also thought it was funny because I feel like we have a little bit of a, a, a couple of similarities. Like uh, you just mentioned that your family was from Argentina um, your parents were, were from Argentina and therefore you are Argentinian, though I'm sure you, you know, consider yourself American, but I, I'm the same. I'm from immigrant family, um, where I'm, I'm Bolivian actually. And, but I'm a hundred percent American. I'm oh. born, born here and speak English. I don't speak Spanish much at all. So. Yeah. I tried to keep the, the Spanish up a little bit and, um, I mean, I get, I'm still a native speaker, you know, which makes a big difference. It's like, I'm, I'm in this weird zone where it's not perfect, but I'm actually still a native, technically a native. It was still my first language. Oh, really? Um, I think my parents weren't that set really. Yeah, well, we spoke Spanish at home. Okay. Uh, and I remember in private, in private, my mom spoke to me in English and my dad spoke, you know, like when, we were, when I was alone with either parent. The, the mom, my mom spoke in English and my dad in Spanish. Right. But yeah, so I like, it, it feels nice to speak to speak Spanish. You know, it's a different part of my brain. Yeah. I have a different personality when I speak Spanish. I'm a yeah, it's, yeah. it's definitely like a different brain because it's a different part. Right, right. Yeah, I only speak Spanish if I'm like really dr like drinking heavily. And like somebody, I meet somebody that speaks Spanish and it's just like, you know, talks me up. Uh, otherwise, like I dream in Spanish sometimes. Like I, like I, like I feel like I do really well when I'm subconscious. But when I try to actually pronounce it, it's that's when I fuck up everything, and I'm, I just sound like I'm a, I, I sound like a five year old, like I can't say anything right. Well, I can't even imagine what the Bol Bolivian Spanish is. I've never even heard that, you know. Plus, there's so many indigenous people in Bolivia. Yeah, um, yeah. that there might be a lot of like hybrid language and stuff, you know, like yeah, like, Paro like Paraguay. A lot of people in Paraguay speak Guarani. Right, right. Yeah, Quechua is the native language in Bolivia. Yeah. And uh, I know a little bit of that. Like I've heard, like my grandmother actually speaks it pretty well. But, uh, and I've heard people speak it, but I don't really know it. Wow. Yeah, that, yeah. Well, that's a big language group that goes all the way into Argentina, actually, even to, in, into the, the Andes Mountains of Argentina. Right. It's right along the spine there. It yeah, was the sure. language of, of the Incas and the, and I guess maybe other, other pre Incan cultures from that area. Right. Yeah. I'm sure of it. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, the other thing I, I feel like we have kind of a, a mutual uh, some some similarity in is is that uh, I, I watched your documentary last night. Uh, the uh, oh, what is it called now? The sound, sound and, and chaos. The sound and chaos. Right. Um, I purchased it from your website, by the way. Uh, Four ninety nine. Great deal. <laughs> cool. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. No problem, man. It was great. It was a really great documentary and. Uh, in it, I realized that you are m very much an uh, like an kind of an analog purist, almost. Almost. Um, it's it's funny. There's a, a bit of a nuance that I need to apply there because, um, I don't actually and never really was convinced that any of that was better. I'm just very aware 
of process and that 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 it's um, a lot goes into making something turn out one way or the other. And um, I'm, I'm aware that it, it's complicated. It's it's hard to draw conclusions that you do this and that's how it turns out. There's like other factors. And lots of times people people are unaware of the factors or don't consider them. Then it gets up, oh, if we recorded onto tape, this is how it turned out. Mm-hmm. So that would be the way it is. And I have I, I feel... I need to, I, that's not good enough for me as an analysis. I need to be, well, what about the engineer? Maybe it was the engineer who was running the tape machine. Maybe that person, maybe their ears, maybe because if it's tape machine, maybe it's just an older person that with more experience. So that's, that's why it turned out better than in a place that it was all digital or, or something like that. Or, you know, so I also, I kind of, I'm just aware of, um, I'm also feel that way about my, my, myself personally is that when things are working i'm not in a big rush to to change them it's just like the same same thing as i know i'm not in a big rush to change myself even like it's like it's working why do i want to like i'm not looking for anything new i'm like i just right. I, I like what i'm doing i think i'm getting results i should probably just keep most of that the same so i think of that in the studio as well so it's so um I, it took me a while to move from tape to um the digital, I did it in steps, really. You know, hmm. at first I had the Pro Tools running with the tape, you sure. know, and then and then I did more to because I I just don't know. I'm not ready to draw any conclusions. You know, how do I know? Like, um, the, what from like one try? I'm gonna go. Oh, that one one A B like listening comparing. You know, it's like I don't know. Maybe digital is maybe tapes better for snare drum and which maybe it is, and maybe digital is better for voice, which it might be, you know? So, mm. so it, there's a lot of nuance there. What about symbols? Sure, maybe symbols sure. are better digital, but maybe depends on the on project network. too. Depends uh, on the band all, and all that. All, all kinds of things. There's just too many, too, and I'm too weeds of that. I, I feel I'm too to make quick, quick uh, uh, assumptions and draw conclusions, quick conclusions. So any, so I always change very slowly in the studio, all kinds of um, stuff. Like I still use ancient pro tools at this point because it's like, why am I going to change this now? When there's like Grammy winning records that people still swear by that were recorded on my old pro tools with those old converters. And it's still, Mm -hmm. you know, you still have, I don't know, uh, Radiohead or something. It's still like records. Still, people hold in high esteem. So I, that's what I. That's the system I'm using. So why would I necessarily just change the reason? So I, it takes me a while. And usually, what it is is when I'm. It's only then, really. It's only when I'm confronted with a reality where I could be making better records or certain stands change. Like there was one point where it was unacceptable to run out of tracks anymore that was it you could not run out of tracks because it was a time we accept one of session saying you know, i guess we're done with overdubs because we're out of tracks can't do anything more we're done <laughs> so so that would people would go oh okay uh-huh, and just have to think about it or maybe make a hard choice of, of like erasing something but yeah no that's unacceptable anymore so that was a point where i, I started having to include digital so anyway, it's a long story to say is i'm not really an analog purist as a as a as any kind of dogma for sure. Right. Okay. But, but you do, you do um, still use a lot of analog. Said for analog. Yeah, I, I do, but it's more because it's what I use and I'm, what I'm familiar with. It's more that than I think it's better and everyone else would be doing a lot better and that everyone else would be better off using the same stuff I do. No, not necessarily. Right. You know, okay. I realize people have this familiarity with the gear. I still always say ears over gear ears over gear i always say that right so it's not it's not the gear making i'm very different from steve albini in that sense who's very much like gear over ear (laughs) right Right. steve albini he likes saying (laughs) he likes saying he's totally unbiased he's a neutral observer he just chooses the gear the gear is the thing that's determined of the sound and i'm like it's still i i just feel the opposite basically um, this is that any change that's the thing too is is on whose dime am i going to make these changes because i'm also aware that if um that i find a way slowly but surely incrementally i start getting better results in like some new way of doing things and it, it just comes slowly by using it i realized the little change things were like i couldn't get a good snare sound on digital at one point and then i'm like oh wow here we are eight months later i'm getting good snare sounds right it, i don't even know what it is it's just little 
sense of like where I place things or attitude about things. Hmm. Um, so yeah, so to change things and you come in and I've just changed something and it, it's going to take me a while. Not necessarily, you don't want to hear that. You don't want to come in to record something with me and I'm saying, hey, I've just, I got this whole new system. Now you don't want to hear here this is what i use i know how it works and i know we can so so that's why i have to almost change slowly as i as i change sure sure so you just you just mentioned uh steve albini who's someone else i was thinking about recently because uh you know preparing to speak with you um i know that you do you do and have done a lot of production work and he's one of those people that i think of when i think of a producer and i know that his his thing is that uh i don't i forget how they say it but he he essentially uh, treats his job as a producer kind of like a like a plumber where you pay him for a position you pay him for for the job and that's it like none of these point stuff like none of these like royalties that come in for the for the recordings he does he gets a flat fee do you do you do the same thing or do you are you kind of interested in points as well um that's a good question i'm not interested in um in points and, and any of that stuff bunch of reasons because a lot of very few of the records i do um, particularly now, end up um, making a lot of money or making any any kind. Of, and the reason I said a lot of money is because I, I. It's funny because there's only one exception. It's really funny. There's one exception. At least four years of record actually get the record. I believe we're talking, which is the Dresden Dolls record. And um, it's funny because I told them as I. And here's the thing: it's, it's the reason I said a lot of money is because I'm not interested in little bits of money from like a record. Like I'd rather the artist get the money and use the money because there's so much to be done. You know, mm -hmm. if you think of a band, they're, they're going to have to like the it, things go kind of well, and they get an advance and some money, some money from the sales. You know, they, they they need money to maybe take take time off of work, or they need a van, or they need new equipment, or they need to put it towards recording all kinds of stuff. i'd much rather that actually serves me better which is the band kind of being able to to take things somewhere and keep the record because you know sometimes bands with them this whole record we spent time on i mean there's tons of there's a good number of records i do and band breaks up and it's like very sad you know the record just sits there or it gets released just sort of as an afterthought like a year or so or two years later or something so i'm not really interested in it doesn't occur to me that I would like any money unless there really was a lot of money. Like the band really does super well. So even with uh, the Dresden Dolls, I told them because, they, you know, Amanda Palmer's is a bit, um, you know, she's a, actually got a good sense of business on her shoulders and, and she uh, wanted to make sure that things were kind of every, every, all the, all the T's were crossed and I's were dotted. And I said, also, I said, you know, I, I'm not, into, we said, so I said, look, if, you know, if you sell over 10,000 copies, then maybe we can figure something out. But until then, nothing, something that I said, not thinking they would ever reach 10,000 copies. And they freaking sold 10,000 copies in the first month, practically, from like her bedroom. Um, right. It was as a self relief. Um, I'm also, honestly, I don't want to, I don't know with Steve L. I mean, just saying I've, I've thought that, um, I'm not sure he has no points on anything. So I'm sorry to be a little skeptical on whether it's completely true. Yeah, I mean, it, it would make sense. I mean, there, especially I the, the caliber <laughs> the caliber of, of projects that he's been on and been involved with. I mean, it would make sense. I mean, but at the same time, it you know, from what I know and at the the loose amount of information that I've that I've researched about him you know, like just scraping by to kind of keep his studio afloat, you know, like, you know, having a hard time making the payments every month, basically. So it's like, well, if you got that royalty from in utero, let's say, like that should probably help your studio out, you know? Yeah, I mean, I've heard through the grapevine that on the other hand, he regretted not getting points on some things, you know? So maybe, you know, I, I guess he's human in that way. Sure. But so I'm not sure it's as hard and, and, uh, and clear cut. I mean, I guess I, I know what he's saying, but he, he got in, he definitely has this attitude of really dissing producers, you know, uh, like very insulting really um, right. about producers. And uh, it's really hard to say sometimes it, it just started becoming this like dogmatic purist position 
where it's like, well, sometimes people want a producer, you know, like with the Dresden Dolls, they wanted to work with someone that would uh, about record, about how to record stuff, also help form the material a little bit, a lot, but some, there was a lot of loose ends or things that needed to be decided or, you know, so I think that they were open to, to a producer, maybe even making sessions on the material itself and arrangements like uh, I don't know, or song choices and stuff like that. Also, they were very young. So it's Amanda, who was like 25 years old. Mm -hmm. I met her when she was 24. Brian Viglion, drummer was or something. Um, you know, so that, and, and had not really recorded yet at that point. Um, so to just demonize the of, of sir is kind of weird, you know. Also, I do very few productions where I'm, um, uh, like sort of a a, 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 um, a dedicated producer where people say I'm the producer, but so it's usually like I'm a co-producer or I'm an, a I'm a producer engineer, um, and right. even within that, sometimes I, it's <laughs> all it's all easy and good. People just tell me how much involvement they want me to have. Sometimes people ask my opinion. Sometimes they don't, and that that's all good. The interest is I I, I feel satisfied. Well, of course, with the people being happy, mm -hmm. and um, with other people being happy and liking the record and how how much or what I do, it doesn't matter so much. It serves, you know, the when there's input that's going to make a difference, I, I love it. I, I'm, I hope people are open to it. Um, <clears throat> but when it's not needed, also just as happy. And I usually think that on the record, including the Dresden Dolls, um, the strongest material need a lot of, you know, extra input. So I, I think that that's better. I think when a, a band comes into me and everything is um, locked down, they they already know it. That they know the songs, and it's, and and those end up being the, the stronger songs on the record. Like if anything's possibly going to be a hit on the record, it's going to be one of those songs. I mean, they're going to be older songs, and uh, they've been they've been kicked around. Sometimes the band's even tired of them. Even with the Dresden Dolls, some of the ones, some of the stronger songs were the songs they were tired of. You know, like Girl Anachronism is a song that they'd actually pre previously released on this like home EP. Um, so that's what I like. I also do think that uh, that it's nice when a band, um, as I would say, like 20 percent. So that aren't completely formed. That's nice. So I like 80 percent ready to go, locked down, in shape, all of that. And then 20 that are, you know, it's a, a, a more of a range on the album. Maybe those two songs are ones where some stray idea of mine can kind of help hmm. um, can be useful <clears throat> or be, be implemented. Um, also, it's, it's of the moment in a way, like you want a record to feel like have this like abstract quality of being in the moment. So it represents the artist or the band in their current moment of how they're feeling, what they're thinking, what they're listening to. And same with me. So to actually include that on the record, um, can give it some special thing. I mean, it, really, you everything about a record you want to be like timely and in the moment. That's it. Some records, to, in fact, the Dresden Dolls, I think, took about like a year to do, you know. But in the really? to to record, but it, yeah, it was a it was a long stretch, a very long stretch, and because, partly because they Boston and I was in Brooklyn, so they had to come back and forth a bunch, and. Um, you want to be able to relate to it. You want to be able to, the listener wants to be able to go into it. And so it being of a certain time or a particular place, which I think is kind of exciting. I listen to very old records. I imagine the scene in the radio and what those people must be like and what, what it would be like to even be in that situation. So I'm, I'm kind of reliving. So the record as a moment, you know, just like live as a moment, that's kind of, so that's why I was saying it's kind of it's nice to stretch out in the studio a little bit because it makes it a creation, it makes it real. Um, so anyway, so that's kind of my, my view of records. I think they're 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 kind of um, an important experience, and I think you know. So sometimes I even in productions now, uh, I don't like gratuitous effects, you know, and and um, so and especially very overt effects. So I'm not I'm not trying to slip in some overt effects. Um, unless they're super good, like it's like well, and then the actual indicator of us actually do being very creative in the studio. But it's got to reach that standard. If it's just some some BS like overproduction, I'm not particularly interested. You know.
Sure. So uh, let me ask you a couple of questions. Um, I, uh, first of all, I asked you to be, come on to the show because I wanted to speak to you about, uh, you know, particularly an album that was influential to you. Uh, in our communication, we kind of like, you know, wound it down to the idea of, of doing something a little different, which is talking about an album that you actually had worked on um, and how that might have actually also uh, influenced you in a, in a sense and, and kind of like, I guess, maybe in the way that you work and, uh, you know, going forward. Um, but before that, like growing up uh, as an adolescent, what, what were you listening to that was kind of like turning you on to music uh, as a young person? Well, Here's the thing is, is that is so long ago. <laughs> sure. Oh, well, what was like so one of the first like, things that like you can kind of like kind of creep into your memory? That that the, my issue with also talking about very influential music when I was, you know, very young actually inspired me in, in, more directly in my work was actually not even records. It was um, live shows. And I'm not so sure if all the and even had records or had been recorded or whether the recordings would be particularly um that special you know um but uh that that would be back in my late teens so like my mid-teens when it was still about records you know i i i came of age as a listener uh in the wake of the 60s it was still all about like jimmy Hendrix stuff like that and so i was listening to hendrix but it did speak to a little bit of of what i what i found important in music and really i think hendrix is that there was something very wild about that about the music also it's sort of improvisational nature and also with the drumming was kind of like this free jazz thing a lot of times even though it was rock mm, um true. and just also his his whole persona uh, the, him he just talked about music and stuff so it was this sort of wild very liberating kind of um uh primordial kind of thing, and, and that was super important to me um and uh, then it was also the complexity i was very kind of into like prog basically so i liked stuff that was more orchestral sounding or complex and even though i was rebelling from my classical music background because my mom was a classical pianist and you know very accomplished we'd go on big tours and stuff and i was i was being taken to the uh um new york philharmonic weekly we had season so every thursday we'd go to the see the philharmonic and i'd be in a suit and tie I saw opera as well and uh you know i i i felt at the time that like i was really miserable with all in all those conditions but the whole idea of like how that sort of upbringing you know my mom would play every night really but like, so after i went to sleep or was kind of almost asleep or whatever my mom would play for a couple hours like practicing in the in the house on right. a piano on a baby grand piano hmm. so how much of that affected my ear? I, I don't really know. It, it seems in retrospect that actually had more of an effect on my ear than my rebel self would have ever admitted to at the time. Because even now in my latest record, I'm freaking like opera sounding vocals on my, right. on my new record. I noticed that. Yeah. And, that, that, and, there's, been, <laughs> and there's been on a few records about these like, like, on, um, so up oh, there, there goes my, there goes, there goes what I was saying that how much I don't like opera. And there I go putting up on everything. Right. Yeah, a little, but, you little, know, little um, contradictory. Uh, uh, it's contradictory. also done in my weird way. Um, my ear is there. Yeah, of course. And then also with like uh, Frank Zappa, I, I love all those huge productions. And, you know, um, you know, I, would, I remember I, in my mind, I mean, I went to see him live at like the at the Palladium. He would play every Halloween. And I remember those huge things with like orchestral drums up on stage. And so I think like a dense orchestral sound was always something that I went to. I know that there's two poles really in sound. There's like the like uh, mm -hmm. it's it's this postmodern kind of straightforward and that has a lot of value. And then there's the other pole, which is very baroque and um, gothier, if you will, stuff. I feel like I feel like the more dense baroque qualities are are a little more of my forte. I'd like to think I am also pretty good with like you know in your face straightforward um i like i think i'm good at that or certainly good enough to do those kinds of projects but those are the polls like for instance when i worked on the band um, worked with the band uh, us maple mm -hmm. from chicago they're kind of a post-rock band yeah I, know. Uh, I believe that was on drag city okay yeah so that was the kind of thing and they're they're not in a lot of extra flourishes right that that record i i recorded for them I actually had michael giraff from swans as the producer and he was ready to stretch out, right? He was ready to like add overdubs and like backup roles and chants, 
percussion and hand taps and, and flutes. And uh, oh. really, and that was just not their style. They were more a little more purist. They were a little more like bare bone kind of thing. So oh, yeah. I still think, yeah. and I think as an engineer, I think I did a good job on that record. In particular, the record's called Talker. Um, but that's the other pole, right? And so they, there is, that was a funny situation because you had Jura coming from the opposite pole. And, you know, we're all good here because the reason they asked Jura is because they love those Swans records. The problem with them asking Jura from the Swans was that that's what Jura does, you know? So if you ask that person, that's why sometimes I recommend with people picking an engineer or a producer, it's like, it's not a question of like loving those records. It's like, really give a listen and imagining and imagine yourself, you know, kind of sounding like that right, or at right. least some of those ways if you're gonna if you're, if you're gonna like uh, um it's not like this sort of like everyone is biased they have a sound it's not like well this person is great they're a great producer and that means they can kind of do anything well N not necessarily you know that's their like niche and look right. i think uh, uh, any producer or engineer should have several niches i'd like to think i've like five things five kinds of things that i'm kind of good at sure but sure. It, unfortunately it's not endless i mean i think I'm pretty good with a lot of stuff but i have my little lanes so you need to kind of figure out what that is well from my understanding of like what producers role is like like my my menial understanding as a kid growing up it's into now where i still kind of understand like i understand it better i feel um I think there was a lot of talk about like, oh, well, the producer is like the the like fifth or the the secret member of the band for the time in which that 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 group is working together to record that album. And, you know, you as a producer, you would probably actually have a lot of influence over like what that end result is going to end up looking like. Um, that's why even if I'm just engineering, it's also arguable that I'm the co-producer. Um, sure. Yeah. I also just from my, my own personal ethics or whatever, and and it's a bit of a privilege. I I don't feel I need production credit on it. I do at this point. I mean, for me, it's almost the problems the other way. Is that is that and it's kind of what you just said. Is that if my name is on it, there's definitely some people that think that I just totally found the band, and that's if they like the record, that's like that's why it's a Martin BC record. So it's almost the opposite. So we don't really need to double down, and that's a privilege. I'm lucky that I've done enough records that there's some people right. that might even think that. So yeah, but in fact, it's the other way around. Where sometimes I need to kind of bring people down and say, no, I actually didn't have that. I didn't do those things or something. Right. So yeah. but that's a privilege. Um, yeah, but the, but but the reality is also is that it does make um, a difference. Um, well, there's a lot of people that could, in theory, do some kind of mix at home, right? Sure. And so the reason that I say, look, I like to, I like to do projects where I'm involved in the mixing, and I try to tell people that even, even here's the point I make is even if I do it entirely entirely their way. Like I'm still in there no matter what. And it's because anything that you say, it's like, let's say you say anything, like we want to be kind of big and wide. We want to be in your face and driving, or we want to be all, all this kind of stuff. And I, mm -hmm. I, I usually invite all those, I usually invite all those kind of kinds of comments. I, I, I often like the, the, the what and the why, but here's my point is that it, it's, someone's going to do that and, and in doing it there's like 50 choices so as i'm sitting there okay i'm going to do the thing that i was just told to do i'm still facing eq choices right sure. i'm still chain i'm still facing and and it's way too time consuming to discuss every little choice it just no one even wants that you know right. so i get in there i do my tweaks i go then when people and then people evaluate um also, there's sort of bias that happens, particularly in the mixing, which no one really kind of argues with, really, is that I'm always inescapably asking myself what is the, my favorite thing about the song, or what is my favorite thing about this band or this particular record, maybe because it's a different record, maybe it's not the first record I've recorded for the band, hmm. as I'm always asking myself, um, well, what is what, my favorite thing? thing it could be literally anything in a song it could be like my favorite thing is the beats or, or or the textures or the layers or the words you know or the quality of the voice all kinds of stuff right, right. And so very simply i just make sure that the listener hears that or make sure that the listener is somehow drawn and whatever little hoodoo voodoo i might do the listener is drawn to those things you know so that right. that happens you know, eventually, 
Like you can hear it in some of the Sonic Youth stuff. Where it's like ultimately, I want people to think that this band, or like the guitars, are really, you know, exceptional and are doing something very experimental and very new and novel. That there's a lot of innovation with guitars. So mm -hmm. that comes through more than like, you know, like it's a cool beat. Oh, it might be a cool beat too. So I, sure. you know, I, so I try to have it both <laughs> ways, but just just enough to make sure that no one mixes it up that no one's going to say oh, oh here is this band sonic youth and it's about the rhythm sorry drummers but so that would be the case with that um sure. same with um you know with the dresden dolls where it was like the piano was unique right. you know and so that's right. kind of something that's kind of rock with drums that's not that innovative whereas having a band like that with piano particularly an acoustic piano not an electronic piano that's an innovation so that should sort of be inescapable right right now because you're already now that you're talking about the dresden dolls um you know this is the album that we're going to be focusing on uh it's this was your choice uh you gave me a couple of options and neither of which i was totally familiar with so i listened to both of the options one one being uh cop shoe cop uh what was the name of that album ask questions later it was ask questions later or ask questions been, later right uh, oh cons yeah okay and then there was this one, the Dresden Dolls debut album. Um, so I listened to both of those, <clears throat> and I, I, I ended up opting to choose this record uh, because it's the first word that comes to mind is is dynamics. I think that this record, um, you know, based on what I know about your 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 previous work, um, all of it is great for for many reasons you know kind of like some of the stuff you were mentioning uh you know all these bands have all these different aspects about them that that are compelling for one reason or another uh and then this album at this time this was 2003 i believe correct so yeah this was uh late into your career so i'm curious like um at the time of this recording you already had a number of recording and producing credits of various degrees of success and and various you know styles of of bands that you were working with so well, like what do you feel about this band and this album going into this record at that time in like 2003 yeah well we actually started recording in 2002 okay um i also met them for the first time in 2001 so it's a bit of a, a bit of a process oh okay um i met a, i met a pan, amanda palmer in my building um uh the the building manager had met her somewhere somewhere i think maybe in europe even and uh, actually had um, been invited and went up to th that weird building in in, um, in uh, South Boston, where like Tremont or Tremont or whatever, okay. and, and Shamut, something like that in Boston. And um, she had she was in this weird building, and um, the building that my building manager from here went there and just to because she was talking about God, what a cool building it was. And it seemed like it was a topic that my building manager was interested in because the person in that building in Boston, the building itself was a, a work of art, right? Like building it, like it was like a, almost like a Cousteau set, like the stairwells. And then there was like a, a tree house in the top floor and a dome mm -hmm. at the top. And, you know, and so okay. uh, he heard her perform there like solo piano and he was blown away and so she came down to New to New York to my building, and I realized later that she was already scoping me out. Right? She was she was a big Swans fan, and she thought, well, let's. Um, she would be kind of thinking about maybe recording. Nothing stone thought maybe it might be cool to to meet Martin and, and see the studio. Um, right. Um, and, you know, it was an interesting time. I got excited about doing it um, for a few reasons. For one thing, it was. Um, you know, I've, it's funny. I mentioned before how I like thinking of myself as pretty young. Is for me, a, youth culture is a big deal. So it's kind of limited me a little bit as a musician that I haven't. I've never fit that well in sort of the avant-garde world of like very serious musicians mm -hmm. that put music at the center of right. like what they do, and it's very accomplished just a musicianship for me it's really a lot of it has to do with you know i'm really a punk in that way is that that it really has to do with like youth culture um i, I feel youth culture kind of saved my life you know uh my, my mom died when i was 12 my dad died when i was 17 so what was there you know i was writing graffiti you know and i was very excited about like hardcore culture and i was really uh 
excited about like about a hip hop culture in the South Bronx. So mm -hmm. it was all about youth culture. So I always felt like that, like you can't lose sight. Like that was that that's this world. So I came from this world where it's like I, I don't put down youth culture. I don't I don't even like the idea of, of like a more adult outcome. Part sure. of me is still like I needed to be I need to be kind of DIY or at least I, I don't want to get too far from that. You know, I still go to a lot of local shows and I, I really support DIY venues. I think they're just absolutely essential. Oh yeah. And so the Dresden Dolls came, they, they came from that. Um, it felt like, uh, you know, when I met Amanda, she was also talk, talking to me about busking, right? So she would perform on the street. Right. So that was, that was interesting. Um, also, like when I was at, in high school, I was in the, the theater class, you know, so her whole thing was very theatrical and, and very visual. And it's, it's funny because I thought about it. It's not like, I'm like, Oh, I want to be a part of that. It's just that that's just familiar terrain for me. So I think when, you know, um, mm -hmm. I even wish she, she actually directed a play in Boston and invited me and I went and, and saw it. Um, and then soon after, um, I met her before 9-11 and then I, I met her in like August 2001 and 9-11 happened. And uh, the first time I went to visit her and Brian, they invited me up to Boston. I was like ready to leave New York. I was ready to like a, a, a day trip. Thank you very much. I was ready to, to just get on a train and go somewhere that was in New York City that, that didn't have a plume of like, you know, putrid, toxic, like, because uh, I was right. in the, I was in almost the daily plume of like, of like, uh, ground zero for like months oh man um, that and i went up and i was like oh wow people going about the business of making music also i i i, I liked their sort of um that's their sort of thing that reminded me of like the early days when new york city was much more affordable and we could all be kind of uh dilettantes in a way and you know like you, you could get but you could survive in new york with like working two days a month or something crazy. I mean, I would, so right. I would pay my nut of studio by before it became a recording studio. Cause it was a two years. So we just had it as a, a loft and stuff. And a couple of us lived here. Like I, my nut was like hanging, hanging art in a friend's gallery, like twice a month. That's the rent. Bam. Right. So there's that life where you could really like stay out all night. I would some often come back to this space at like dawn because we'd be at the mud club and all this stuff. And that there's a lot, it's not so, it's not like lazy. We were working our asses off and, and, you know, sure. I think you need that kind of, this world now where, where, where people are like, like suffocated with suffocated with having to have like three jobs to like pay, pay a rent. That's like 40% of their income. I mean, it's, it's not good. And, right. and you were losing the, the potential of like, I mean, look, look what, look, look what that, ex that time did for the culture of the world and the culture mm -hmm. of New York city. It was like punk and, and all kinds of art scenes. And it was New York city was a New York city was a, an arts capital. But anyway, so when I went to Boston and saw post nine 11, saw the Dresden dolls, I liked the fact, one thing that caught me was like, wow, they dress, they go out at night and they go out during the day and they're dressed the same, right? There's no work clothes, right? So they still are going out during the day looking like goths like they right. did at night. That's yeah. a little thing that, that caught my eye. I was like, that's kind of cool. Also the, with the material that there was a, 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 a humor and a self-effacing humor. And right. I thought that that was cool and, and very exciting. I mean, I'm a, I'm a sucker for novelty. Like I like, uh, I know nothing's that original, but you know, when something at least feels original, that means a lot because I know it's pretty hard considering nothing's actually original. Um, so that, uh, you know, I don't even agree. I'm not a steampunk. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I like, I was, in fact, it was the opposite because in the, um, in the, uh, in the early eighties, I was like a futurist actually, if anything, I wasn't like, like, like the, the, the Dresden doll song, um, um, girl anachronism is someone that just doesn't feel like this is their century to, to really like live. Right. If only they could live in some other century, they would be fully realized. And, you know, right. um, all that stuff, like with Africa Bambada, right? All the hip hop was very futurist, like Africa Bambada, light craft work. Yeah, so like that record, uh, Planet Rock, I believe, was all like craft work. And the reason they loved craft work is it was all about robots and computers. And then they they would take their, they, and, the, and the breakdown was like, we're automatons. So I was always, I was actually a futurist, so really the opposite. So in some ways, it's funny, I've always felt like I'm a bit of a, a traitor in terms of all these little, uh, movements of like of in in music because i'm always like Chameleon. fascinated but 
yeah, I'm a comedian. Yeah, like, I'm not that, you know, it's like I'm always, like, someone's got to believe it. Maybe that's why I'm also in some ways, aside from the fact that I make my own music, a bit of a, I'm a good fit for being a producer engineer because I'm not that close or that attached to any one thing. And I also exactly. see some value in, in mixing right. sort of different influences and stuff. So, so if you want, as long as people mean it, that's what draws me in. You know, it's like, it's like, I know it's nuts, but if they really mean it, then, then we're talking about something that's compelling. But yeah, like I always feel like my the stuff that comes out of the studio and me as an artist or producer shines better. Um, I feel during a crisis, like I always feel like somehow during the times that are a crisis, I, I feel more energized and the stuff that comes out of here, whatever it is that I, I contribute or the people that are drawn to me or whatever it is, or mm-hmm. it, it just seems more vital or people are more, more needed. I'm more needed. My perspective, my, my insanity is more needed in a appreciated when there's a crisis out there people relate to it more sure sure well so, art, art in general i mean you know people are always kind of clinging to, to art in, uh, in times of uh of uh you know uh trouble or so forth um but now so you were saying earlier a little bit about uh the, the dresden dolls you met them in 2001 and so you already kind of were familiar with what they were doing at this time prior to you know agreeing to move forward with the recording sessions yeah well the first day i met amanda palmer she was brought to the studio by the building manager and right. and I met her. And then that, I think the next day, she was going to perform in um, in his loft, in the building, on his piano. And he was going to, like a, it was like a brunch. So okay. I, like, I met her on a Saturday. And then the next day on a Sunday, she was going to perform to some of his friends. I mean, this whole thing is right up rally, very bourgeois. They're mm-hmm. like you know, people in, like truffles and like, you know, uh, it's the perfect setting really for her in an, in a, in an old factory. Right. So right. Um, that's going to play on this piano. And, and he was like, you got to be there. And so I was like, okay, okay. I mean, I pay, you know, he holds the, the lease and the rent over my head. And so I was like, of course sure. I'm going to go. <laughs> so, so sure. within 24 hours, Hours of meeting her, I I saw her, probably her first performance in Brooklyn. Period. So it was in this. Um, so I saw brunch, and I couldn't even stay for that many songs. But I I, I got a sense of what she was doing, and um, uh, um, Michael Jura from the Swans. He was my roommate then, so he was actually living at the studio in the upstairs area, and so he was there too. So so it's both me and Michael were oh, in wow. the room. So we heard Amanda. So I got a sense of her. Um. um her aesthetics, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, I don't know. It, it, it's not enough for me somehow, like just hearing piano and voice kind of right, right. just. So this was, this was pre, and, pre Brian joining. So when did you yeah, get I to see it, Brian after he I think, joined? I think, I think she had met Brian the previous Halloween. So I think, I think they oh, met okay. in like 2000. I think they met in 2000. In Halloween, on Halloween, because I think between this hanging out, but between this brunch in my building, that and 9-11, I believe that they did play in this bad place right by the Port Authority in Midtown Manhattan. That's probably all they knew. Um, And so that was Dresden Dolls, because I think she did mention, well, I'm a busker. I do this stuff. And then I'm kind of thinking I'm sort of starting this band Dresden Dolls with with this guy Brian. So I think it was in there, but it was, I don't think it was clear in her mind that that was the only thing she was doing. So she wasn't all vested into this one thing, but she was right. dabbling in, in that and having a collaborator. So she invited me to the, the this show at this place called Siberia in Midtown Manhattan. Not good. Mm. And um, I, uh, I saw her play with Brian and that's usual. It's like, like sometimes I just op, I go, I go on two things. I go on communication um, sort of people being willing and wanting to like do something special and maybe be a little ambitious in terms of a production and work and, uh, and feeling that there's a spark there, that there's something there. And, and, and I'm pretty <clears throat> loose and easy with uh, taking some chances. If it really rubs me the wrong way or there's nothing there, or I don't feel like I communicate with people. Actually, that's the biggest red flag. I feel like we can't communicate with people because there's got to at least, I got to at least enjoy the work, you know? Sure. Right. So if we're communicating, we're usually having some fun. I mean, that's really the bottom line. And um, I felt that that was there with them. So it wasn't all about being blown away 
by right, their show right. Siberia. It kind of wasn't that. It was kind of feeling um, like there was something there. And then once I started familiarizing myself a little more with the subject matter of her song, <laughs> you know, it's funny when we were first starting to talk. I forget what we were actually. I forget what, whether we were actually committed to working or not. But she made a comment that she felt uneasy about the, some of the songs being so juvenile, you know? Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and it's funny. I made a comment to her. I was like, well, maybe we're going to get lucky because if that's what you're feeling and you could do it well, I hate to say it, that's, that's <laughs> not to be mercenary or make it about money or succeeding, but that's one thing that seems to really work, right? Which is like, that's, that's the market that seems most hungry for new music and new artists is like teenagers, right? So, so if, you know, do what you want, but if you're feeling that and you have something substantial that kind of relates on that level, Hey, hmm. I, I don't know if I'd look, a uh, look a gift horse in the mouth. Right. Maybe yeah. that's good. That might be, that might be, you, you, that might be good for you that you, you got something there. And like I said, I'm always inclined towards a sort of youth culture and, thing anyway. Right, so right. That, you have appealing that, that did work out for them too. So, yeah, and actually, when we were like digging for material, I wanted to dig even deeper because I realized she had all these um, unfinished songs, like tons, piles of mm. unfinished songs, you know, and, yeah. and and scattered. I think that's why she actually part of the reason she wanted a producer, like a producer producer, was just, right. that she had a lot of scattered songwriting, and she had uh, she's a um, <laughs> dedicated mm. archivist. So she was even as a teenager, she was archiving the whole, whole thing. So there'd be like boxes, love songs, you know, boxes, film ideas. Hmm. boxes you know all kinds of stuff so she was really documenting stuff and putting them on cassette and right. so i was like you know i want to check some of that out so th this is by the way what i was said earlier before earlier in our discussion i was saying i like on records 20 percent of the record being kind of free unformed free open. not fully formed right yeah so so i was into so i i love the fact that there were songs that were old and done that they they that they'd in the case of Girl Anachronism, I had already even recorded, and uh, but not really properly released. And I was like, no, that's good. That's strong. I liked it. It was like, that, yeah. that one's cooked. <clears throat> right. Ready to go. It's probably going to be super effective. But I also liked this sort of nebulous area where there maybe maybe there's like some, you know, album tracks. I don't care if it's the last song on the record. Maybe there's some stuff that's we can discover and kind of work on. And I was fascinated by this idea of like stuff written by, by a, a teenager. Like I was really, there's something there that we wrote when you were 16. Let's take a look, you know? And so there's the song, uh, bad habit, which is about cutting, cutting herself. Yeah. Right. I was okay. like, Oh, I don't even, I don't even need to hear the song that that song we're doing, you know, that's gotta <laughs> be in there. That's well, um, okay. Weird. All right. Well, look. You know what? Yeah, we should so get, like, we should get into the album. We should actually discuss it. I, if you want, I was going to do a kind of a track by track kind of thing. Not every single track. I, I've selected a few kind of choice cuts, and um, so maybe we should just kind of get into it. Is that cool? Sure. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. So uh, right off the bat, we have the first song, "Good Day." What I was going to say about it is that uh, so we have um, we and we have an introduction, not just uh, not just to the music. But something I'll touch on repeatedly, I'm sure, as we kind of keep on talking, the dynamics, like I said before, like very quiet to loud dynamics and vice versa throughout the record. Like who whose idea was that? Huh. Um, also, this record was done in the wake of the 90s. Dynamics were a big thing in the 90s. Like mm. I, I will say, I will say um, it's funny. I don't time in the aughts particularly towards the late aughts dynamics were not um a big topic i mean i used to have meeting with bands like i would actually meet with a band that maybe was going to work that was considering working with me and the main topic was dynamics can you do that they would play me records that they liked and the whole idea of just things exploding like it was all very like every like everyone would say we want in the nineties we want explosive music it's but but everything's you know relative right so for it to explode it's got to come from something that's less explosive right so the whole topic of how you can get these contrasts very contrasted things and part of the reason 
was difficult. It wasn't easy back then. And then I think now that everyone has more home studios, the idea of just, well, it just gets louder. That seems very simple. It wasn't so simple in right, 1995 right. to get kinds of dynamic. So <clears throat> I think at that point, um, that was still um, a, a, a topic was um, just, it was a standard kind of in, in, uh, in production and record. Um, also, I've, I've, uh, I've had Brian Vigley on the drummer, the Dresden Dolls drummer. I've had him play in my band sometimes. Oh, and yeah? I've seen him play in other bands. And he's got some next. I mean, he's one of the loudest drummers around. Like, just like, it's like insane. Right. The amount of volume that, that he could put 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 across. Sure. Um, and actually, the reason I think he's beneficial a lot, a lot of beneficial in my band and beneficial to a couple of other bands I see that, that employed him were, was... Uh, that that he forces the band to 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 deliver and play on a certain level just because of the dynamics that he imposes on it. Like he comes in and it's like when it's loud, it's pummeling, it's big, and he's big, he has big sounds, big cymbal crashes, big right. tom fills, and it just forces a lot of big stuff. Right. Um and so I think that that between Brian and also just like just sort of a a, 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 a the way I was really doing things back then that it just got to have dynamics between that. And also the other thing, which was, I, I realized over the years that I have um, a bit of a thing I do, which is the sort of middle bridge freak out. Um, and, and a lot of the songs on Dresden dolls have that where it's just like, where it's like, um, yeah. And then another example with spot, spots where it's really done in the studio you know, so I think in in Good Day, there's it's like this freak out a little later. There's an like instrumental passage where there's yep. more guitar, and then there's like these. It's the only place where there's like three pianos, three full pianos of going this kind of thing. And I think that that was a thing of mine that I kind of realized over the years. I've, weirdly enough, I think I'm doing it less now, but you know that was there in Sonic Youth. Uh, like on Death Valley 69, the song that was there, it's like the mid freak out with voices coming from everywhere, you yeah. know? And then okay. there's like a, a shadow of shadow of a doubt has that as well. The middle, the middle blowout. And um, I think that that was just a, a thing I like doing. And uh, also some of these, these, these instrumental passages didn't have solid ideas. It's like, it's just instrumental and there's no feature, there's no voice. So I don't know. And so I think like on that one, I helped orchestrate if you will, just like, a lot of stuff. So we had this guy add Frank who was doing the guitar. And so just do a couple more tracks here and ended up kind of using them all or panning them or whatever. So somewhere in there, there's the, so that's some dynamics for you because that really um, pumps up. Yeah. Um, also, um, you know, I'm always down for, I'm always down for having it two ways. So at the beginning there, it's super crucial to have the, the toy piano. That's a big signature of that record and of the Dresden dolls. Generally right. it's, it ties into, um, first of all, they're goths. At least they were back then. Sorry, I know that maybe they don't like hearing that, but they were goths. And so goths are really kind yeah. of obsessed with, youth, with with children culture. Forget about youth culture. Children, like toddlers, right? There's whole songs right. in there. Well, they're, they're called about, dolls, like, even. Like a so, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. So, so the idea of like a toy pant, like a toy, don't think, don't think, you know, it's kind of, right. it's, on, it's on a few songs. So that's yes. already going to be yeah. dynamic. So this will be quality. Cool. And then, of course, Brian doing something very minimal, like yeah. So he's very dynamic too. So that's your question about dynamics. Okay, yeah. But so, uh, but so, some of the 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 uh, the choices that were made. Uh, let's just think about this song specifically for the time being. Um, like you were saying, like the the middle section of the song, like that's kind of a lot of your con contribution to the record and to the recording. Yeah, I think so. Uh, also, again, the a bit of a producer thing is. Uh, um, Amanda asked me, she, she was not attached to, she was not attached with any particular approach. So she was, should this be, cause it's kind of rock music, a lot of it. So should there be a lot of guitar on this record? She was like, I don't know. Should there be like only guitar? Hmm. Who knows? Like, it's just that there wasn't the, kind of anything was at least open for discussion. Right. It's funny. I ac actually took the demos that I had on cassette or something. And, um, uh, played played to them by myself on guitar, and then I kind of realized that they it all sounded much more conventional. 
if I, uh, with guitar, with me playing guitar along to them, it sounded much more conventional uh, and that okay. it was much more unique with piano. So I was like, I think I just called Amanda the next day after I did a whole little evening of my just playing guitar along to their, to their songs. And I called her the next day and said, you know what? I think not a lot of guitar. The, the, the question that might, that did come up eventually was what about bass? There's no bass in the band, but that's mm. sort of an extra topic. So we did okay. slip in, uh, bass on a few songs but I had to be very careful because I didn't want to like you know you have to be kind of consistent with bottom so why would there be a big bottom on one song and like sure. none on another you especially to, with the keys because you, you have both already you have bass notes on the keys yes so you can get away with not you can get away with maybe not bass so if you're going to add bass on something uh, maybe it might be overkill if it's low keys on the piano plus the bass plus we have to be careful on the bass. so that topic did come up about bass like the, the song gravity for instance um, okay. does have bass but hmm. um so guitar was this sort of dangling thing where like they like i, I didn't want to kibosh the idea completely i was a, a little down on really adding a lot of signature like, rockism on guitar even though it's a rock record i thought that what's unique is if we can get away with it without using guitar right but that's right. a song interestingly enough it's the opener and um the ad is guitar so um hmm there and we were judicious about it and um also that contributed a lot to dynamics because the guitar as i recall is not at one level the whole time or the whole time so when it really works it's up so sure. that also right. probably adds a lot of punch yeah yeah no i think i think you're right i mean considering like how how i remember it because i'm not totally familiar with it but i've been listening to it obviously a lot the past uh past couple of weeks so um yeah, well that's but, great but, 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 can you okay. just play me the front of the song? Yeah, sure. Okay. That's the actual recording? That's the, yeah, that's the record on, on digital. Yeah. Wow. It really has a, like an old, like Victrola, like speeding up and slowing down kind of quality, like a watery quality. Yeah, I mean, I don't know, you know how you heard it, but yeah, I mean, it, it does have that. I mean, it has like that that fake uh, vinyl crackle going on, and then the the break where it keeps on like looping, where it sounds like a broken record. I'm just like, this must have driven vinyl record fans insane when they first heard it, like thinking it was. You know, like, I'm, was a I'm glad I asked you. I had come. I, I remember that there was. A, I remember that there was toy piano at the beginning, um, but I completely forgotten about the record thing. Dun, 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 like it right. skips. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, I complete. Wow, I completely forgot about it because that theme is also on a, a section of Coin Operated Boy. Coin yes. Operated Boy also has a has a track skipping moment. Right. Um, a little further in, and this was now. Oh, fuck. Now I remember that we added the that we added the vinyl crackle. Now I forgot about that. So I'm right. glad I asked you to play that. Did that, did yeah, that make, the, did that it's, it's make funny, customers go insane? Where like people complaining that it's just like, oh, I bought the CD and it doesn't fucking work. Like the, right off the jump, it like skips. No, no one. Com I've never heard. I've never heard any. Uh, any complaints. Okay. All right. Just uh, curious. Um, but wow, it's, it's interesting. Um, I think that using the the crackling was a little con is either contentious or I was a little skeptical of it at first. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe because I was thinking it was kind of getting in the way or there was some kind of thing where I didn't know, well, well where does it stop? If the crackles in, we take it out. And, you know, right. and I'm, I can get pretty precious. I can get precious about intros. It's funny, like the thing that I, I put extra thought on in general is I'm always looking for distinctive fronts and ends. Um, not everyone can have a distinctive front or end, but I'm always loath of like, also loath of, all, too many songs starting the same way so sometimes i do point that out to people a third song that just starts with the just the drums right so i'll point that out to people sometimes people don't notice because they're so involved with thinking about the body of the song and i'm always I'm, i tend to think about the fronts a little bit more than the sure. ends too because sometimes it's, oh, it's the end because like, well, then sequencing the end? sequencing it's too like putting it on. putting it all together on a record it's, it's just like well okay we got three or four songs in a row that start off with drums like come on like <laughs> that's gonna be a little weird yeah it's so that's the, and then when it has to be i might even point out okay but by the way maybe these shouldn't be near each other or something you know so right. yeah. um so i think about that so the idea of extra craft going into the intro of, of a good day um 
makes sense. And, you know, um, also has that very, yeah, I mean, it's definitely a, a sort of, there's a lot of like middle-class existential uh, crisis that goes on in this record. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a, a lot of like, um, like in that is sort of making fun of, I picked, like I had a productive day because I, I learned how to play croquet. I, I picked up croquet today and I'm on fire. Right. That's one of the lyrics, I think. Right. right? So the, mm -hmm. that, I always thought that was kind of cute or whatever, but it's definitely like um, self-aware of the privilege a bit and this sort of exist existential crisis really of middle class, this kind of co inner conflict about like real work <laughs> I think and things you know people you know really contributing to society or oh, not or right, how right. can I? I think it had a lot to do with her busking, like that whole aspect that she could actually create a lot of her, like uh, basically generate her her living uh, off of a lot of busking, which is essentially you know I mean it, it's the next. I, I'm not saying this this disparagingly because I, I I appreciate people that busk. I really really do. I think that that's an admirable thing that you go out there and you do something to earn your keep. Like, you know, like people that are that are out panhandling and just out there with cups and it happens everywhere now. It's that 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 annoys me to a degree because I always used to give my money to those people. But now I'm just like, OK, wait, there's one on every corner and all you guys are just doing is sitting out here with a with a sign. Like at least somebody is out there being productive and like doing something, offering you something and contributing something to society uh, to to, to kind of earn that money, you know? And she did very well with it, you know, at the same time. So um, I think that's admirable. And I think that's kind of what that song implies a little bit. Is this like this, 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 um, like she, I think she went on to do this too, like further on that, like in her career, like with that book she wrote and stuff about the, uh, I forget what it's called now, like. Uh, the Art of Asking. The Art of Asking. Right, right. So it's just like coming to grips with the idea that it's okay to ask people for money, especially if you're offering something in return. It's not like you're just asking and that's it. You like you're you're contributing something, and I and I appreciate that actually. Yeah, um, I, and I also appreciate it being kind of um, exposed and and being open uh, open about it. And right. um, you know, so she has this existential crisis, but also a lot of stuff that people can relate, relate to. to. Like if right. if you look at the Dresden Dolls fan base, it's <laughs> well, for one thing, it, it's at least in New York City. Uh, a lot of her fan base seemed to be from outside the city, right? They seem to be, it's like suburban mm -hmm. um, kids. Uh, actually, it's funny, the, the label that they ended up signing with, so funny, was Roadrunner. And I remember Roadrunner being a label that used to really put out Long Island bands of all yeah. these sort of like- And like, like metal stuff and, too and hardcore, right? Like a lot yeah. of like heavy stuff. Yeah, hard, hard, yeah. And then eventually very metal, like Lamb of God kind of stuff. But, but there was a time- um, yeah, like hardcore bands and and stuff, but it was all this sort of disaffected, lost middle class youth. I kind of saw that. So then, when when you get when um, uh, uh, Dresden Dolls got signed to Roadrunner, I was like, oh wow, that's really the the demographic. Um, it's funny because I I have um, I have this book the uh, the Dresden. Yeah, I have been looking for that, <laughs> and it's been so hard to find. <laughs> yeah, so I have. Um, Anyway, I kept it here in case I needed to remind myself any of the lyrics because yeah. all the lyrics printed out. It's really pretty great um, okay. book with a lot of little collage. -y. Yeah, kind of like the CD artwork, right? Yeah, like all, like all. I mean, there's definitely a, such a strong like aesthetic of like, um, like low production. Like, like hear the hear the lyrics to girl anachronism like you know done on a broken typewriter just like you have on the on the song that, that we were just listening to like a, a broken turntable or a broken disc that's skipping right you know yeah. it's like it's like this like broken old technology um so yeah. here's good day right and that's it was that her actual uh like lyric sheet that she she had written out or was that kind of specifically done for that the I, that's what's implied i i don't really yeah. know Okay. Um, so, but it's it's done very nicely. I'm gonna have to try to yeah. buy that at some point. I'll have to when if I if I come across it, I'm gonna pick it up. But I I had a really hard time finding that. I I mean I knew I could have ordered it online, but I was trying to not order it online. And uh, yeah, it yeah. didn't work out. 
Well, like another lyric is, I took out the trash today and I'm on fire. Right. So mm-hmm. it, it's that this sort of like dilettante life. I think she she went through a lot of bit of like liberal guilt. Um, I think she was feeling a little liberal guilt even when I met her. Um, yeah. It just just comes in there. So it's I think it's laced through the record, and you know I think, I it, think that's yeah that's cool. I think you're right. It it is a, it is a bit of a kind of constant theme. Um, so let's let's move on to the next song. Uh, I was wanting to do a girl anachronism. I I. I had to look up the word because I wasn't too familiar with it. The definition of anachronism is a thing belonging or appropriate to a period other than that in which it exists, especially a thing that is conspicuous, consist, conspicuously old fashioned. Um, so considering the lyrics of the song and you were kind of mentioning it yourself was that uh, I don't see the title and the content. I don't see like the title kind of like reflecting the content, the lyrical content of the song too much, or it's like, it's a little uneven. Um, unless it's just Amanda's sentiment of her feeling out of place, which I think is totally common. I know I experienced that myself. I know I see that uh, with my wife. She's actually feels very much like that. Um, oh, okay. But what I want to ask you is, do you feel BC Studios and is a chronic and a chronic, I can't even pronounce it now. <laughs> and a chronic, and a chronic, I can't and pronounce it. Anachronistic. Not to be mistaken for anarchism, but yeah, some of these uh, crust punks in Boston would go, would they go, girl, anarchism? Because they, they didn't know the word, right. so they would mis- mistake it. Okay. Um, yeah. But they hold on, do doesn't that. she say, I do not belong to this century? Hold on. She may, yeah, there might that might be there, but I mean, let's like that's like one line. If you read all of the verses, it's just like, um, it's all of these weird I don't know. I don't want to say faults necessarily, but just like the idea of less like, you know, you look at me and I have this and I'm like, you know, broken or bruised and this is this and, you know, and I'm just like, and then I like the part about like, that's, it's like, uh, please excuse her the day. It's just the way the medication makes her. Right. Right. Is that right? Yeah. But but that doesn't say, but you see something like that. It doesn't necessarily say anything about being out of place in time. I understand the sentiment. But I don't think that it's necessarily anachronistic. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's funny. I mean, I, I just never thought of that. And you're right. Um, I, I think that, that what the title implies is that that's the source of all these problems, right? It's sure. And, and what I always thought that was strong about what I always thought it was strong about that song was at this point, an artist's career. They have to really define themselves. And there is something to be said for the I am songs, right? Like I even thought um, uh, like Madonna, I am a material girl, right? Like mm-hmm. it's this self-defining. So if you think of Amanda's girl anachronism is is sort of the same kind of vehicle as material girl was for Madonna or, or Iron Man was for like Ozzy or something, you know, it's like this sort of de- defining, I guess I need something like that. Right. I think that this sort of self-defining thing was actually kind of really important for her. And it's interesting how that needs to be. If, I mean, I know it's a little bit of a, a, a uh, this uh, premise is a bit nuts. I know, but it seems like there are artists that, that put early in their career songwriters that put some like really defining thing defining song that's self-reflecting and that really captures it and not know what they're about and what they're gonna be about for like a while and uh, i kind of call them the i am songs right but i think that that was part of the idea of her being mis misfit with the modern world and um you know and uh just on a different wavelength and maybe that the thinking is that you know this fiction that maybe in some other century that maybe she wouldn't have be considered. You know, sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, no, but what about Ill. BC? What about BC studios? Is it, is that anachronistic? Anachronist? Oh, fucking Christ. I can't pronounce Anachronic. that word. Anachronistic. <laughs> yes. BC studios. Anachronistic. Well, yes. Yeah, well, well, it's fun. I'm, I'm also contradictory myself. Cause like I said, there was a minute there where I was kind of futurist. Um, right. You know, a lot of the hip hop, like I said, was, was futurist really at that time it was and i, I mean it was that was completely innovative i mean it was it was 
you were you guys were creating yeah, and something Dylan, new. And and even the, the 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 title of the album that Rocket is on, uh, Future Shock. So that mm-hmm. was the, that was the whole you know uh, idea. And then like I said, and I used to, I used to love craft work in 1977 i loved craft work and uh, the that song which which a lot of my graffiti writing friends we would play that on the subway we would play uh trans europe express on the friggin' like train like on a boom box as we were like tagging tagging up um yeah. but yeah the bc studio which by the way came later because the studio when i first started it was called oao which right. stood for operation all out correct uh, which was taken taken from a William Burroughs book, and um, I, I had to change the name at some point after Rocket because Bill Laswell. We, we sort of split up, and he wanted yeah. to take, it, and it just seemed like I needed a new name. And I and I didn't I actually did not love the the BC, but all the names that people were were, were suggesting. I don't a lot of people suggesting names, and all of it was just awful. No, we're not calling it Sound Mecca. You know, that's not going to happen. So <laughs> I was like, okay. And then I was like, <laughs> and then it occurred to me, you know what? Just keep it simple. BC. And, and you know what's funny is BC was supposed to, and you're right about being a, a bit of an anachronism, is BC was supposed to sound like, it was actually nothing. I know there was a lot of like Sonic Youth actually called it, bef- called my studio before Christ Studio on one of the records, I guess on Evol. Mm-hmm. Um, because because I, I was explaining to them the studio the name change and I was like, well, I'm calling it BC because you know it's well, it's kind of like my name BC, but then it's also you know like before Christ and then the Thurston was like, oh my God, before Christ, that's cool. And so then that's on the that's on some record before Christ Studios, and of course I didn't object. I'm like, sure, whatever. Um, and uh, but that's not really what I meant. I didn't. It, it was no comment on christ at all sure. what it really what it was was bef- I, if i could have called it before common era that's what i meant i meant hmm. before common era so i meant before them before this modern world because i was personally and yeah maybe i guess i'm a bit of a boy anachronism you know because i i was i was fascinated by the you know 150,000 years before for like any of this modern stuff that we can talk about, whether it's religion or agriculture or anything. So mm-hmm. I kind of like, I, I felt like that was like, I want to sort of suggest like there was something primal about what can happen, you know, in these walls that it sure. was somehow uh, that that's what I, something I related to that it's not about like current trends Although yeah, it kind of is, but that that there was something as a reminder, and then just to be stupid, just to say that it was really about before Common Era and not Christ. Um, the logo, which, again, embarrassing. The logo that was on some of the track sheets was a dinosaur. I can't believe I actually got someone to design this for me. Like, I actually said, "Hey, can you draw me like a dinosaur holding a microphone?" Thanks, fifty bucks or take you to dinner or something. So I actually had there on some of the. Uh, track sheets for records until yeah. I got embarrassed by that and realized to get rid of that stupid thing. It was a diet, like a Tyrannosaurus Rex with a microphone. So stupid. But yeah, so that's what I meant. I meant just like old pre, even pre human. Sure. Pre language. Okay. Right. I was very into like the idea of pre language of the, of music being like the original language. That's or the first language, first mode mm. of communication. Yeah. All right. Listen, um, we're actually kind of running out of time. So I'm going to skip uh, a few songs and uh, uh, you sorry. Been- no, 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 it's okay. I mean, but I just, you know, I just want to be mindful of your time. I don't want to be here for, for hours, but um, I want to skip down to one song that I thought was fairly important, um, Bad Habit. You mentioned it a little bit earlier. Um, seems fairly obvious to be depiction of, of, a, of a cutter. <clears throat> um, but, uh, but the term, Bad Habit, I was just like, I don't imagine you have any studio bad habits, do you? Well, I, 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 uh, can get pretty hopped up on the old caffeine. <laughs> That's um, not a bad habit, I don't think. <laughs> no, but I mean, I, I I feel I'm a bit of an abuser of it. But I, I am I'm all about trying to have the right habits in the studios. Uh, and it, uh, an understood and um, intentional part of I think our good practices. Like for instance, I even factor in that when people arrive, we need to shoot the shit a little. 
you know, so I need, I, I also factor in that, that, that the first session, if it's been, if it's the first session in the month, you know, like maybe the holidays go by and so we don't work or people are away and then they come back. So it's been a while that, you know, the, you can't just jump right into work. You got to like, you know, t- you know, update each other on your lives a little bit or something. There's something there where it's like the second day, maybe we're going to jump right into work, like right away. I can go, okay. So I was listening a little bit before this and, boom, you know, boom, 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 boom. So everything, even the shooting the shit is, is kind of worked in, in my mind as of something that's important and should happen. And that I just factor in. So mm. it's all about good, good habits in the studio. And I never mix alcohol and uh, any kind of music making. I don't think I ever have, like, I don't okay. think one in my life, I sat down to write a song and even had a beer. I've never played a show and had even a beer. After the show, that's a different story. But sure. but it's just that there's nothing about alcohol that seems like it would make better music for me or, or you know, like because because I the thing for me that I struggle with with music is any, if anything it's like it's like maintaining some sense of the cognizant the 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 rational functioning part of the brain that's right. what i struggle to hold on to because it's very easy for me to get lost even this way because i don't meditate right and so people have i've i have friends that that are skeptical of mine not meditating they're like you know it'd be pretty probably could be pretty good for you you know and i just don't but occasionally a friend of mine will see me work in the studio particularly with mixing and go you know i get it i get it i get why you don't meditate because you kind of you kind of get some of the benefits because you the, because I do deep listen, right? So sure. even if I'm mixing anything, even like some even some goofy shit, I'm still if I'm mix, I'm still deep listening, you know, and I'm still kind of getting lost in there. Right. So if anything, I struggle to maintain my sense of like, well, I got to keep that rational self still kind of tethered in there because without that, who the fuck knows? We'll just we'll never get done, or we'll, we'll, I'll go on yeah. tangents, you know. So wow. I got to. So, so alcohol does it's not in the service of keeping the rational self like tethered. So, I, I, I never right. touch it during any music creation of, at all. Okay, well, that's good. Um, but so, what I was going to ask is like, well, so let's turn this around then. If the, you know, if you don't have any bad habits, like, what are some of the best practices you can offer as suggestions to the budding engineer or the band in the studio? Well, there might be different suggestions actually with the the budding engineer. Well, this might. Only- almost just be the way it goes now. But what I've, I've heard in the past is, is ambitious engineers or producers, young, just starting out, really feel that they need that the one project um, to, you know, devote themselves to, to really work. And they, they kind of invest in like a project very intentionally. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it's just me, but I've often felt like, I am the worst judge of that. You know, even with Dresden Dolls, I, I'm the, I was the worst judge. I never in a million years would have thought that it went, would have gone well. You know, um, all of that stuff. So the stuff that I thought was going to do well kind of floundered or didn't particularly do well. And then the stuff I thought was never at a chance or wasn't even maybe that good. But I, I knew I made it as good as it needed to be or could be or should be or any of this stuff. And I know I gave it something, but mm-hmm. I'm aware of its deficiencies, but then no one else can hear it and it actually works and people love it or something. You know, so it's like you can't really tell. So with engineers, I would be like, just do stuff. Don't focus so much on like making it an oeuvre of yourself as a recording engineer. Um, you know, give it something. Do ap- Absolutely do as much of as you can of making it, making it a great piece of work, but don't let that bog you down because you just don't know. And a lot of what's going to make the magic happen is, is what the artist does on their own separately from the record. Right. So, so my point is, it's like as an engineer producer, like if, if you're, as if you're hoping that a band's going to take it over some finishing finish. And I don't, I don't, I don't, um, um, I don't, I'm not like Albini, honestly, I don't bemoan people trying to be successful. I think it, it's all a big mess of like trying to be successful, trying to do something good, being true to yourself, pleasing mm. others. I mean, it's a big friggin' mess. Any anyone thinks that it's that they're pure can be pure in that. I, I think it's a bit bit of a self narrative that you're saying. So someone says, you know, I want to succeed. Uh, that's okay. I care more about whether the quality of their work in that in their succeeding. But yeah, it's there's too many factors, and it's not all just about you. So take some chances with uh with artists and maybe more than less 
you know, so prioritize it. Don't get down to into details and, and rabbit holes that in the big picture might not really even help the artist. You know, mm. slip in some details, sure, along the way, but don't let it bog you down. As far as as far as far bands, uh, I don't know. Uh, don't play too often in, in your local town. That's the other thing that happens. I see these bands that are just starting are just like ready to play as much as possible. Well, why else have a band, right? Unless you're like playing as much as possible. And then I just see their shows getting worse and worse and worse. You know, they're mm. playing worse places. They're playing with worse other bands. Right. I, I, yeah. I don't know what to tell them, but just don't oversaturating and playing live. Um, and recording is, is a good thing, you know? So uh, when you're, if you're not going to record, if you're not going to play that much, which I think is kind of smart, also ex uh, stretch out as a recording artist and, and get some recordings in. I also would suggest um, not to um, not to self-record so much. I know I would say that. Come into the recording studio and spend a bunch of money. But I also do think that um, um, sometimes people, uh, like they, they do, do too many demos, you know, or they, they, they demo something too well. Me, mm. you know, I have a whole system, right? When I demo a song, all that is off. I record it in the, the simplest, most straightforward way. I almost deliberately record demo ideas in ways that could never, ever be used. So if I'm putting, doing my guitar, it's direct. It's not even through an amp. So I'm not even, I'm not even attempting quality. It's a demo. It's a demo, period. It's mm. a sketch pad. It's a sketch pad. And I right. think there's it, it's too easy for people now to like get sidetracked into because they have home studios, right? So they spend money on having a home studio. So then they got to like get to really learn how to use it. Right. You know, right, right. I think you're better off not learning how to use it. Maybe put it in the closet. That's my opinion. But then when you do it, do it like you mean it. Right. And, sure. and, and then, yeah. So, and when are you going to do it like you mean it? Maybe what, once a year? Right. So then I guess that home studio is just laying fallow there rather than something you were like using every day. So I think that's, a, I think we're getting into a weird moment, you know, with music and um, yeah, be careful about some of the, the options that people can have that can be maybe not productive. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's skip to another song, uh, Slide. Um, so this song, I don't really like this song. I find it exceptionally creepy. Um, but there's that in like insane intensity near the end of the song. Um, it, it gets really, really blown out. Like, do do you recall that at all in the sessions? Wow, do, do yeah, you know what happened there? Yeah, uh, thanks for reminding me about this. It's funny because it it does have that pedophilia uh theme. Yeah, the Orange Man. I mean, creepy right. as fuck, right? Yeah, uh, very um, disturbing, and not Trump. Uh, yeah. and then there's, and then there's, <laughs> and it's, it's just like that song missed me, right? The, the third song in the record missed yes. me is also about pedophilia. It's also about an older man and again, conflicting feelings, right? M missed me as that conflicting feelings of a, <clears throat> of a woman in, in her middle teens, just realizing that yeah, she has sexual power. Right. Yeah. That that's, I, I, well, I don't know that experience. Right. But I could imagine, and I trust from others that have told me that that's, that's a shocking thing where you suddenly have control, but you're also a victim. You know, you're also like, uh, right. you're also uh, prey, but then you also have power. And, and that's also can be very confusing. So that's mm -hmm. all over that song, this like tortured conflict about this sexual power. And so Slide also, uh, I remember from um, Amanda describing it, the the, the title and the song and the slide of the, of it is was slide from innocence, from sexual innocence of yeah. um of a of a young person and then the orange orange man that's going to make promises or make like so it's fucking about pedophilia but then um the song at the end um was it's really funny because i record remember did i mention x models somehow in their conversation we didn't talk no we, we haven't talked about yeah. x models well this yeah, this no. the, the song the, the band x model that's another x another band that's very pummeling and very distorted. And I remember with that band X models that were sort of like um, this renewed, like no wave kind of thing that they, their, their thing. And I was recording them at the same, I was mixing them at the same time as Dresden dolls. So X models one week, Dresden dolls the next week. And I remember X models. One thing they told me is the, the frequencies have to be utter, like the high frequencies, the, the, um, the high overtones and have to be piercing and painful. We want, 
pain to come out from the frequencies of this. So we we pushed and pushed in the mixing, even in the mastering, as most the, as painful as possible. And, hmm. and a okay. part of what we did, which I don't usually do, I don't I don't normally like maybe four times really. So once a decade, really, do I really go for distort an entire mix that I run the entire mix through like preamps just almost like they would like be distortion things um this other record i did fairly recently called uh, by this band upper wild a fantastic band upper wilds um they actually we messed with distorting the mixes but i told them to um we did but i was like you know what i think because they they were going to use a mastering person sarah register the mastering person who likes she likes doing that she likes applying a bit of, of saturation to mixes i was like you know what she likes doing that she's good at it I think we should do the mixes, maybe preview what they would sound like distorted, but maybe that mastering person should do it. So it's a rare thing for me to do. I, you know, but I, I was doing it with X models, like running, we would mix and then we'd run it through like these kind of crappy preamp we have on soundcraft sideboard and just redlining that shit, right? Mm -hmm. And um so Amanda at the end of that song was kind of like we need things and we do we need guitars or blah 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 and i was like huh because i've been doing it all week what if we ran just the end the whole thing just like slam red line completely like in the the red blinking lights just on right through these preamps and then like find a way back and put it so and leveling it out because it was basically adding like 25 db to the final mix at the end and then splice it on and that might be some of the dynamics that you noticed on this record but oh, i'm yeah. so glad i'm so glad you noticed that that at the end that was this hilarious thing that really just worked that was like sort of thanks to x models who had uh like forced this and some of x models are in right so x models by the way, you started a point. You saw one of the people from X Models, Shaheen, in in Oneida, Oneida the band that, that you saw at Lily, oh, at right. Lily Pad. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So one of the one of them was the the actually he was the person that told me the, that the frequencies had to be like a fucking drill in the fucking eardrum with that previous band X Models, which I which I recorded. So I've known him for twenty years. So that was around when we were finishing the mixing of Dresden Dolls. But yeah, that's what happens at the end. Of the, the orange man song slide oh, okay so it was mostly just like a mixing thing it wasn't necessarily like an instrumentation something in the studio that was recorded that way no and um it also shows how much overtones because it was definitely nice better more musical the distortion was more musical than if we had just used distortion pedals that's right. clear <clears throat> um yeah, but yeah. but the, all the overtones that you're hearing of like it's, it's like piano so really uh it's actually kind of beautiful right because there's so many you know, pianos got all these complex overtones, right? It's got like each hammer has like three strings, three strings that are not perfectly in tune, can't be perfectly in tune. There's no perfection in the universe, right? Mm -hmm. So there are these three that are just like, like beating against each other. That's why piano has this sort of glow to it. And you take whatever that beating is and you ran it through this thing that's also from that beating going to create like a whole stack of harmonics. It's going to be sonically pretty exciting. And so that's that's what happens at the end of that. We were like mm. laughing. She, she thought, wow, it sounds like Marshalls. Sounds like like double Marshalls. Sounds like Helmet. You know, so it was like, right. wow, we have a little Helmet here at the end of the Dresden Doll song. Yeah, yeah. It was, it's pretty wild. I mean, like it definitely stood out to me. I was just like, holy shit. Because like, it literally clipped, I think. It was like literally like listening in like earbuds. And I was just like, this hurts. <laughs> so funny. Yeah, that's, that's totally what we were going for in that one thing. In a bit of a... That's what's nice. That's what's nice about having a few. Like, I'm, I'm not into throwaway songs. Like, I, I'm not into throwing a song away ever. So you work on it, it should exist. But there's something nice about having these like B songs that you don't have to be so precious with. Sure. You know, that you, you could kind of play around a little and try something different and out of the box and just kind of fuck and then just go and maybe laugh a little because because I think I think me Amanda and Brian I think we laughed a little bit about that ending at the end of slide and we thought it was funny yeah. it's funny but just quick top on the co topic of distortion i actually thought that one of the best choices i made so simple one of the best choices i made on that record because i think i made the choice it's not something they have asked me for is the distortion that added on girl anachronism um on the voice um because it's immediately arresting and it's interesting after the sort of nicey nice 
da 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 of like good day and mm-hmm. i picked up croquet today and then it's like this anger right that comes in on the voice it's got this this angsty quality that yeah. comes through with the distortion of the voice on um so when i hear that when i hear the record from good day which is a bit of a long song and then going to the the build up and then the voice entering of of um girl anachronism i find it very very summoning very uh startling mm. and uh arrest arresting is the word i was looking for okay yeah i agree with that yeah for sure uh now speaking again you were just mentioning how uh how kind of joyful and how uh, pleasant that experience was mixing slide and kind of coming to that conclusion uh we're going to skip to the last song truce um so the song truce itself it's kind of like a long-winded take on a bad breakup essentially like lyrically it's kind of a little almost immature you can kind of tell maybe it's one of those songs that she had written a long time ago um Let's see. There's there's just a lot of words in this in this all for saying something fairly simple and something every adult has most likely experienced. Um, the difficulty of separating and then having to try to stake claim to places where you hope not to run into that person. Um, in closing, I imagine or at least hope that your experience making this record with the Dresden Dolls ended harmoniously. Yeah, it ended uh, harmoniously. I I I, uh, I felt a little weird by the. It got tortuous, really, in in a way. Yeah, it, it it was long. We had a lot of joyful moments, and it was long. And I had to re rethink about whether I wanted to go that far into these in, into a rabbit hole. Because one of the reasons I suggested we talk about this record is because it was the last record, really, of this era of really being like an all in get super involved with the band um production and uh you know i i feel that there are there are records i've done more recently that that touch on that sort of involvement but not quite on that level so i i do parts of those kinds of involvements parts of that with different bands some it's more of the mixing some it's more like i realized i did get more involved with the vocal production or or you know some more or less on arrangements, but with Dresden Dolls, it was everything and, and all. Um, but you know, it's uh, Truce was, was also a very, um, it's a very experimental song in a way. There's a lot of touches there. There's some part which is one thing I thought was worth mentioning is that there are these, I guess I did mention it, there are these a lot of breaks, instrumental breaks on the record where I kind of we stretch out with ideas and stuff. And Mm -hmm. um, on this one, for instance, there was, there's a lot of string arrangements, right? So I had this idea of, of like almost with like sampling, like a sampling aesthetic where I I wanted some string parts to be sound flown in. And I remember um, uh, we did this weird process because when you, there's a string quartet on that song. So when you have a string quartet, usually deal with one person, that's common thing right so you have one person that's sort of the leader of the quartet and that they communicate things that the artist or the producer want to the quartet and they they handle the arrangement they handle like uh harmonies and stuff and Mm -hmm. they kind of make it happen so on this thing we did the thing where um i i wanted i think it's somewhere in that song there's a disconnect where i wanted pieces of and so I settled on something that was like a descending line. And I was like, something like, like a dripping. And I was like, if the, if the string could, strings could do something like that. And so, but I don't want it to be in time. So, and, and, and I was still on tape. So I'm not sure I really even had like that efficient a sampler, certainly not a stereo or multi-track sampler. So I was like, so I was like, so the, the, the players aren't going to listen to the music. And then, uh, I think it's like w- some one of us will have will be able to listen. I forget exactly how it worked, but we were going to the the key was that the the players were not going to hear the music, and we would cue the director to then signal them, and they would do it sort of in sort of an almost arbitrary place. Or that's right, we the, even the director didn't hear it, so we would cue the director, so we'd be listening, and we would say something like "go" or something, and then the director would just direct them to play the figure but it wasn't clear where it was and then we did like three takes of this so they're 
in different places. So there's a lot of experimental stuff. Huh. And then actually there's some, pl- you'd have to find out where that is. But I remember it was pretty clear that there was a few of these descending lines. I would pan them. And so we got pretty experimental. Then there was uh, this a spot somewhere in there, like a break. And if you listen, it's very quiet where I thought, I thought we were kind of fucked because I had the string quartet uh, set up. Suddenly it started, you know, my place is a little noisy and, um, it started rain, pouring torrential rain happening outside, and you could hear some dripping. Like uh, you, it was actually coming through the mics. You could hear some dripping in the back, like on a pipe or something, or on some pipes. And it was like yeah. some drips on some pipes, and and I was like, "Oh fuck!" I was like, "Man, I got to move them. I got to move because there is a quieter option, right? There's a little other part of the room, the other room. It's like oh, I'm gonna have to move them all. The mics, what a fucking hassle it's gonna be." And right. then it just occurred. Yeah, I was like, you know what? Maybe it's not so bad if there's some dripping in the background, you know. So, and yeah. then I realized, wow, I think it's kind of adds to like the creepy mood because it's it's. I I know the opposite. I know the opposite. I know the opposite of trying to put water sounds into something. Like when people go, oh, it'll should sound like maybe there's a a, fa- a faucet dripping or a faucet on, or maybe it's maybe some sounds of like some rain or you know, and you know, some running water. And adding those sounds and making them sound like water always seems super hard. Like, right. And so the idea that we had dripping that actually sounded like dripping, I uh, was like, maybe that's good. So there's that on that song. Hmm. Um, the thing okay. that I like about that song really in a way is, is, is actual reference to places. There's a reference to uh, a cafe in Harvard Square called uh, right. Cafe, Com- cafe Pamplona. Yeah, yeah. And. And that's in there. So, and actually, it's funny because there was a, a day, for some reason I was up in Boston. I was like, I need to go to the cafe. So I need to go to Cafe Pomplona. And uh, and I went and I had a, ca- and I had a coffee. And uh, But that was the place where they would kind of go and kind of hang out, in, I guess, while she was busking because it was right there off of, right near Harvard, Harvard Yard. Yeah. I have a feeling that she actually and, even worked there a little bit every now and then. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And there, there was, I think that somewhere in the, all this record, I think they mentioned Tuscaninis. Tuscaninis, yeah, I think that was a, an ice cream shop where a lot of the, the gothy yeah. buskers would work. Right. Okay. Um, but anyway, so I really liked that she was mentioning places because that's always the thing is making a recording feel like it's of a place in time. All this, if you look at my music videos, I got songs about Gowanus. The word Gowanus is in there, right? So I have a mm-hmm. um uh, save Slug, save Sludgy, the Whale of Gowanus, right? That's a song on the one of the BC thirty five records, and that's oh, yeah. uh, that's a vi- music video. So it's Gowanus. We shoot it by the Gowanus, and then I have a song um, uh, on the new record, Feral Myths, right? It's um, uh, a storm called Ida, right? So it's us walking around uh, oh, yeah. Gowanus after a storm. Feral yeah, myths. there you go. It's the second. Yeah, yeah. yeah this is the second song on there. So that that. So there's a, definitely there's a sense of place, right? So that's another uh, device in music that I kind of like of something, um, you know, like even when I hear like really old stuff, and I think, oh, it's 60s music, but it's from the Bay Area. That impacts my thing. Or I listen to The Doors, like L.A. or something. Or I listen to oh, yeah. some kraut rock. And I think, oh, interesting, you know. So I think place right. and time, these are cool things to place in music. So um, Slide has that. So I love that that she mentions, uh, and it's not corny, I think, the way it's presented there. Um, also, I like on the song Jeep Song, right? So Jeep Song, another song on the record that has a, a big sense of place. And, right. and it's so cool, really, in a way. It's like every exit has a narrative. Wow, that's a, that's great for a song, right? Mm-hmm. That's a, I mean, I, she doesn't explore that exactly like, oh, this exit was this or that. But like every every exit, because I, I definitely have that in New York when I'm like, oh, wow. It's like, I mean, I was on a street last night, uh, West 24th Street, where I realized so much of my life had happened on... There's so many significant things that happen on West 24th Street. And even something I, I got confirmed, confirmed, you know, Catholic, confirmed. And I realized the church actually was on 23rd Street, but you could see the back of the church because it was like a big church with one of these slanted steel roofs. Yeah. Um, and you could see it from 24th Street. And I was like, so I'm always thinking about this stuff, how amazing to see bits of your own history in a place and stuff. It's kind of a, it's a bit of a mind fuck. And um, kind of cool. It's funny. Anytime I drive into Boston and um, I'm seeing, um, I often think of the song Jeep song because I think of the exits and I'm like, oh, what? Each exit is a heartbreak. Each, each exit is a, represents a disappointment. Right. And you're looking for, you're looking <laughs> so, for a 96 Cherokee? Cool. Ah, 
Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Take that Cherokee right off the it's trail. Like, is that is is that Amanda's ex boyfriend driving around over there? Is that could that be him? And are you looking for a blue Volvo? Right. Right. Yeah, she'd that be in the blue Volvo. Yeah, blue Volvo. Yeah. Which right. I saw. I saw yeah. that that was the that was the car they were they were driving on their way down from Boston. Oh, I bet. Yeah, I'm sure that that's a real that's a real thing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, so um, yeah, I think we've wrapped it up for the record. Uh, just as a kind of a, a, a closing sentiment, I was curious actually. Um, I've heard so much about you know all your work and the bands you've worked with in the past and so forth and like you know we were even talking about one of them now the Dresden Dolls uh who like what has what have you been doing lately in the studio like like who are who are some of the bands that you've worked with like most recently um I would say that uh I'm so grateful for to work with the band Clone I I would say right now the the well Clone we just finished and um and then there's the band uh, the resistance company which i'm right in the middle of and for different reasons so those two really have um um so for instance uh clone which i, I they're not really shoegazer you know but they they really was exploring a lot of layers right so a lot of guitars Mm -hmm. and then some synth and then effects on the vocals and then you know you know analog effects uh, effect delays and stuff on vocals and stuff and very kind of intense mixing and uh, so also some songs there, there were some of these stretch out in the studio songs which I like that they tried to salvage because they were tough you know they were tough it was like wow the bridge and I was at work and go to the thing so it's really because I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of an arranger in the back of my mind I don't think I need to be involved in arranging a lot but when we do go there and I am involved in arranging and I'm trying to help figure out better arrangements for things it's a happy place I like it's I enjoy it you know and I also enjoy vocal vocal making vocal composites of vocals so that band had a lot of vocals so it was a lot about like um you know uh, um examining you know should it come from here or here or like how is it better or vocal treatments and stuff mm. all that is just <clears throat> i like talking about so I, I like talking about vocal production a lot and so that that record clone has it um similarly also with resistance company there was a lot of writing the songs here so even i had some input on um because because uh, the resistance company are also political allies they uh they donate their services as a band playing outside uh in support of resistance movements so they they were playing outside of the you know, or let's say near the homes of um, some su Supreme Court justices in D.C. and at some protests, some uh, Extinction Rebellion protests. Hmm. Um, you know, they have they have battery powered amps and stuff, and then drums. And they supported us here in Gowanus, where we had an action. We do a bit of a protest outside this public hearing on the rezoning of Gowanus. So I got them to come and play, and they did some of their environmental um, material, and I sang with them. Vote no, Gowanus rezone. Vote no. Go on this rezone and this kind of stuff, right? So, um, anyway, as a sort of barter, I ended up recording their record, and then and then mo it's mostly political. And so, and as a fellow activist, I was like really honored, and I am honored to have helped, <clears throat> also even with lyrics and stuff. So that's an example of like I'm not a producer on like every aspect of everything. I'm like the Dresden Dolls, where I felt I really kind of got in on everything. Weirdly enough, except lyrics with Dresden Dolls. So in this band, it's really a lot of stuff with lyrics. I even helped, came. I even came up with the title, um, A Land Defiled, weirdly enough. That, mm. that I ended up suggesting that. I was like, well, why don't you say like a land defiled in that spot? And then it was like, well, actually, that's pretty good, right? Because at the end of the course, is like, okay, maybe that should be the title of the album, uh, the title of the song. So there's that, the Resistance Company. I should also mention White Sons, S-U-N-S, -S, Sun, like very few lyrics. Mm -hmm. And, and kind of screamy and really buried. But that, that was a band where they had like just all kinds of stuff, like amps like blowing up and like triggers on the drums mm. and okay. stuff feeding back, and like room mics and just a, a lot kind of like an X models kind of thing. Like the, oh, okay. that the Oneida member used to be like a bit of like that, just like yeah. heavy, kind of crazy, but kind of experimental and, and pummeling. And, these, and you know, so it's funny. I, I, excuse me. Are these New York bands? Uh, every everyone I mentioned is New York. Yes. 
Okay. And um, so actually it's funny with, with those three, those are kind of poles. Like the resistance company is, uh, is kind of kind of nineties. It's like, it's almost like sound garden a little bit or something like that. Right. And then the, um, and then um, clone is a little more like shoegazy, like sort of loves the eighties a bit kind of vibe. Sure. Um, they're, you know, I think that they're they're a little like a place to bury strength or something. And then uh, White Suns is, I don't know what it is. I guess it's like a, a sort of wave noise revival, definitely noise. Okay. That's so cool. you know, I, I I feel quite good about. I, I I like I like having different kinds of things happen. It really helps because weirdly enough, I do learn from one thing and you know, like, hey, you know what? Maybe we could, and it's fucking comes from like something I did like earlier in the week or something. Shit, it's not bad to have extra like experience to, to draw on and stuff. Yeah, you know? a lot of lot of influencing going on, a lot of influences uh, kind of coming f- from all around. That Yeah, that's why I do like framing the studio as a little bit of a community center. Right. For a few different but I, I do, like, I do like framing some of these small businesses, just in all these arguments we have about how to use our resources in an urban environment is that some of these things like record stores, like record stores are a bit of a community center, right? They, they really, they're important for um, uh, people coming together. People put up flyers, um, you know, they're, they're kind of curated. So like the store owner might put stuff on the wall that they might be other, there's conversations that happen. I know from going into on tour, I tend to poke into record stores when I have extra time, try to sell them a record. But then inevitably, I have a conversation about the show I'm doing. Or someone's, oh yeah, I know that band. Sure. Blah, 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 blah. And then there's like an Instagram photo, and then we're kind of, you know, it's like these. The where else would that happen? So it's got to happen somewhere. Like the in person, the in person, it's it's too easy to lose track of, and and it's not factored in quite so much in a lot of our discussions of like, like land use basically in, in, in these cities. And there's a lot of crazy urban, urban planning that's happening now. People are really thinking about what the world in the future is going to look like, what our city is going to be like. Um, yeah. So for me, recording studio, recording studio being community center being important because it's physical R- record mm. stores. These are all kind of things I'm, I, I try to advocate for as much as I can. Sure. No, it makes sense, man. I mean, I, I really admire what you do. And uh, I I know that about your struggle. I mean, like, obviously, from watching the doc, uh, and then just kind of hearing, hearing you speak about it uh, constantly, uh, because it's important, because it's it's true. I mean, uh, the the clips in the the, the movie um, of, of Gowanus and your surrounding area, I was just like, holy shit, like, how, how do you even live there? <laughs> like, like, it looks really bad. Like, it's very polluted. Um, I don't know what it's like there now. I have no, I have never been there actually, but um, so I hope things are getting better. Wow, uh, yeah, the, it's it's really it's Brownfield Central. I mean, it really is Brownfield Central. There's a brown. There's thir- in the 82 square blocks of the rezoning of Gowanus. There's a uh, there's what 35 um, 35 brownfields. Brownfields meaning that they need to be remediated in the state. New York state is overseeing some kind of cleanup and they're considered, they, they need cleanup to be habitable and safe. Um, right. So uh, that whole topic, and we're learning more and more. I mean, it's, it's all hidden. Like it's, if you walk around here, it just looks like streets and stuff, but what's under those streets, what's under the, like, I was shocked. There's a, a place near here. It's like a, like a bar a shuffle shuffleboard bar, like shuffleboard stuff. It's kind of big. And I realized, oh, wow, they have a vapor intrusion barrier like under the whole building because that's it's so carcinogenic just the vapor coming through from the soil because of this all these petroleum products and stuff so it's um yeah the the pollution is kind of incredible really wow uh not a foundation you have uh some organization uh in in regards to goannis and this this cleanup that's happening correct yes avoid of Gowanus and if anyone's interested voice of and there's a lot of the stuff we're advocating on there and there's always some action that we're advocating for like a, a, a letter to the governor that we're we're signing we're having signed by people yeah stuff like that and um and some information yeah so we're, we're operating on a lot of fronts we're suing the city <laughs> on, top, on top of everything so um yeah voice of Gowanus. okay well great i mean uh, I know that we're not, we're not, we didn't, we haven't expounded on that very much, but uh, if anyone is interested, I'll, I will supply links uh, in the show notes and all that so that uh, people can, can 
read up on that more, kind of become more informed about it, and obviously, uh, you know, sign petitions and so forth and uh, and support in any way that they can. Yeah, and it's, it's all tied together. Like it's all it actually really really is <clears throat> tied to the um, even also the survival of the studio because greed doesn't know any limits and it plows right through health considerations or considerations about small businesses or considerations about the arts and and every everything all of those is all of that stuff is consistently done as a band-aid they do it's all it's all green washed it's all art washed it's all these stuff where they just do a little bit without really profoundly um ad addressing or fixing or mitigating the problem it's just like a little bit and they go yep we fixed we, we're doing this so they're doing just enough that they can just enough that's, the claim that's that not they're interfering helping. with them. right yeah exactly so it's 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 um so it is all tied together because it's the enemy is the same one no i hear you man that's it sucks um look i wish you the best of luck in everything um i thank you for the records i mean i did buy them but i but thank you for uh suggesting this uh the x nilo is a great album and then your your new one, Feral Myths, obviously not on a, not available on vinyl yet, but uh, you can still pick it up on CD. And um, yeah, I wish you the best with that. Uh, are you touring anytime soon? Or are you going to do any more gigs? No, it's probably going to be in the fall, and that's still coming together. So not okay. this spring. All right. Well, we'll we'll direct people to your website and all that uh, good stuff so that they can find out what you're doing and when, and they can catch you. Okay. Thank you so much, Martin. It has been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks again. Talk to you later. Thanks again. All right, man.